Now, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Transitional Justice. I'm Jay Fidel on a given Monday, and we are joined by Mariana Sussman. Uh, she's in Bogota, Colombia, and she happens to be the sister of Nicholas Sussman, who we know so well here at Think Tech. Welcome to the show, Mariana. Hello, Jay. Thank you so much for having me today. Great. Thank you for coming on. So we're going to talk about uh, testimony and reparation in the context of listening to sexual violence survivors. And you are a psychologist, and I, and I feel that's very important, especially in this context. So um, let me ask you, uh, what, what do you do in that regard? How do you listen? Who do you talk to? So um, I work as a consultant for um, the Transitional Peace Justice in Colombia, um, and uh, I um, help with uh, all the topics regarding the victim participation in transitional justice um, scenarios, and um, also particularly on the evaluation of um, psychosocial damage uh, within um, human rights transgressions. That's more or less my job. So I usually work with victims, but also with other professionals that um, uh, share with me this uh, transitional justice scenario, which is like very, very complex. What is sexual violence in, in the course of your work? Is it, is it rape? Uh, is it abuse at home or is it both? Uh, it is mainly what we understand, let's say, as rape but also other violences uh, that transgress like the, the intimacy of the victim um, through violence and uh, all what we have come to understand as, as the sex, sexuality that is not only like a, let's say a penetration, that uh, it's usually associated to abuse, but also other violations uh, to the victim's dignity and integrity and uh, its intimacy. Does that include violations and penetration by a woman's husband? Yeah, of course. Um, but let's say that particularly in this scenario where I work that is um, war and uh, armed conflicts, uh, usually it's outside of the home. But uh, what we have seen is that uh, usually there are um, a very uh, big correlation or, or the, there is an unstructural violence that uh, occurs at home and also uh, regarding the context of armed conflict. So um, they're not really uh, exclusive from each other, but they, they are um, in some cases like related. Yeah, well, yeah, in many ways, I guess. Um, you know, we've been hearing about rape in uh, Ukraine. Um, we've been hearing that uh, it seems to be, um, you know, uh, a culture point among the Russian troops. Uh, whether it's uh, by instruction or negligence on the part of, uh, you know, their senior officers, they they are raping Ukrainian women as a regular matter. Um, so rape, I suppose, comes with war, and rape comes with the kind of violence you you have in the hinterland of Colombia. Um, how does that work? Um, is it because the people who are providing the structure of the of the military force or paramilitary force are saying you are free to do this or is it because in the fog of war uh, whether they have instructions to do it or not to do it um, the violence around them um, makes them more inclined to do it because of the violence in general I think that's like a very complex uh, question that has like very different angles from which we could understand like the, what, what inclines these actions. But what I think is important here is to understand that in these cases in war or in armed conflicts, um, there is uh, this tendency to assume that sexuality is a form of uh, it's like an expression of power. And uh, particularly in this in the case of women, and uh, these, um, let's say, patriarchal society um, we live in, it's usually um, a way of saying to the enemy, um, I'm owning what is uh, valuable for you. So in this sense, um, women are uh, dispossessed of their subjectivity and their value as human beings and become an 
instrument for war uh, to tell and to humiliate the enemy, which is usually another man, let's say, or, or the, like the, the expression of masculinity within conflicts. Um, so it's a, a way, a, an expression of power and to say like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm owning this in the same sense, I could own a territory or invade or conquer another land. So I think that's like the main motivation. Of course, there are also other elements we would have to evaluate, but um, I think that's like the most uh, common um, explanation we have find in this in this sense. Well, that makes a lot of sense. What you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is: are these are these um, uh, still talking about um, rape and war, or rape and you know some kind of political violence? Is it usually accompanied by injury? or murder uh or is is there ever a situation where it's uh, simply a young man who hasn't had a lot of sexual experience and uh this has a certain non-violent aspect to it or is it always violent uh well i think it's always violent in the sense that if it's always a transgression that requires violence if it is not violent it, it wouldn't be a transgression right so uh, in the sense that um, this, the victim's subjectivity and will is uh, undermined, I think it is always a violent act. Um, now, uh, from what I understand of your question is that um, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure, I wouldn't say it has to do with, like, with the sexual craving or desire of, let's say, a man that hasn't had like a lot of sex uh, in the way you say. Uh, I think it's, it's really these, uh, this uh, need of in imposing oneself on top of the other, you know, of, of um, the, the act of, of submission, of, of having control on top of the other. So it's, it's always violent. Um, it is uh, sometimes accompanied by injury or in others, it doesn't. I think it has to do with the, with the um, concept and the value the perpetrator perceives from the victim. So let's say if the victim is, um, a person that um, is, is part of the enemy, let's say, of the enemy's forces, uh, its value is always or usually more undermined than the value of, for example, a, a civil person, like a, a citizen. Uh, and in that way, the transgression tends to be like more hurtful because I want to annihilate him or, or her. Um, well, in the, in the sense of, the, of a civil person or, or citizen, there's, there's not such um, a will to emulate the other, but uh, just like to use it. So it's it's different, but I have I think it has to do with the the concept and the value the per the perpetrator receives from the victim. What about um, an audience? Uh, this in this context is the rape always by itself in private, or does this kind of rape? Um, psychologically require the perpetrator to have somebody watching? Well, not not always. It has to be somebody watching. Um, but um, sometimes there is, and there is a bigger transgression because it's like the exposure of the victim and uh, of its uh, submissiveness and um, the fact that I can use or I, I just turn this person into an object and is validated by, by the, the others, which are commonly part of the same arm organization um, the perpetrator belongs to. So, so it's like um, an exhibition of my power as a perpetrator in front of the other. So, um, but, it, but it's not always that way. It can happen in, in private because um, it's, it's always like a, a subjective construction of my power of, and a, a reaffirmation of, of myself. So um, I have seen both, um, just that they, they have like different uh, intentions and, and different motivations. And in one of it, like the, let's say the, the public one, you're uh, telling me it's, it's an, an affirmation of, of the perpetrator's power in front of the other. So the victim is more objectified, not, not only by, by the perpetrator, but by the, the one observing. And that's like very transgressive too. What about age? Um, you know, on a demographic basis, um, uh, do you find that this kind of uh, violence happens uh, against young women, including, you know, really young women, um, or, or in somebody in their 20s or 30s or 40s? 
uh, or somebody who is a senior and, and, and um, you know, an elderly person? Or does it not matter? Well, I, I think it, it's not a set as a, a particular criteria, but yes, it's, it's also, it's very common to, or, or more used, um, using more usually uh, the, these cases in, in young women, uh, or let's say between their, their 20s or even um, um, teenagers uh, until their 40s or 50s. But I think uh, the explanation of that has to do with the, again, the social value we have attributed to women in society, which is a, a reproductive value, right? So it's not about their value as uh, subjects or, or their social value, but what we have come to understand as their as their value to um, be like reproductive uh, beings. So uh, I, I think that explains why it's more common to see um, that the victims are women that are like on their reproductive age, because that that way the perpetration is like to the society, like like to the the possibility of this um, of the enemy um, um, extending its its uh, line. Um, so yeah, you're breaking another norm, yet another norm. Yeah, still another exactly. norm. So uh, that well, that raises the question of uh, how often um, does this result in pregnancy, um, and is is pregnancy what brings these women to you? Um, because that's something they may not be able to control very well. Um, how 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 often do they get pregnant, and uh, and why do they come to you? What what connects them with you so that you can help them? Well, I think uh, pregnancy is a result sometimes. Um, it's, um, I cannot say if it is usual or not, because also we have like the limitation that the, the most of these cases are not really uh, reported. Uh, they, they are lived silently. So unless they have like, uh, let's say big consequences on health or for example, pregnancy, women um, tend to remain silent because of the social judgment they are exposing to. So I cannot say if uh, pregnancy is, is a, a common result from this, but um, I wouldn't say that pregnancy only is the thing that brings them to, to look for help because the, the transgression itself is it's very destructive uh, for the, the mental, um, Area, let's say it's a it's a, a transgression and an elimination of of yourself. It's like uh, seeing yourself reducted to an object to to see you reduced to let's say nothing to the eyes uh, of the perpetrator. So um, the the violation itself is just like a a reason enough that it, it brings a a victim to look for help. Of course, a pregnancy is a more destructive because it's a change on your life project, on um, the way you're conceiving yourself, on um, a lot of things that are, of course, uh, um, very um, disruptive of the way you're carrying on your life. Um, but I would say, like, just the violation itself, it's reason enough to, to bring them to, to look for help. Yeah. Is it, now, <clears throat> they come to you and, and they've obviously been through a traumatic experience. Um, who who puts them together with you? Is it through social agencies, uh, family, friends, um, government? <clears throat> what what brings them to your office? What brings you to their residence? Right. So um, as I said before, uh, it's not so usual uh, for these victims to look for help in the uh, states uh, institutions because they have been also uh, very violently treated and judged by the, by the state. So um, they try to remain silent or to look for help within their, their most closest uh, circles. Um, but there are a lot of, like, of organizations that um, usually um, carry on um, a justice process in, in, the, in their law sense. And then uh, through the process, they see that the victim requires some emotional support. And that's where they call the, the psychosocial worker. Or, um, but, but it's not something that is looked for immediately. It's, it's always like an, an aid that, that comes like among other processes mm -hmm. um, because they, they have been like very badly treated by institutions. So it's not very common 
or usual for them to look for help immediately. It's all, always like by the side of another process that is going on. Is, is the, uh, you may not be able to answer this, but is the experience in this area, the, um, you know, the, the, the social experience um, different in Colombia uh, and other countries in Latin America, other countries in general? Does, does Colombia have a, because of, you know, um, the violence in the countryside, if you will, um, the, do you have a special problem in this regard? Or is your is 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 Colombia's problem the same as other countries? Well, um, I would say um, this is a crime that is very linked to a system of beliefs, um, in the sense of what we have talked to about the the value of women in society and how we see the transgression, like not not to them but to a, a social morality or or to a man that owns her. And uh, I think that has a lot to do like, with the culture, of course, of the country. I think in Latin America, we have like a very um, religious um, weight on our beliefs, even if, if we believe or not. And um, there's also uh, this like a moral frame in which um, a, there's a, a very present misogyny that makes it, I would say, worse than in other countries because we are not a very prepared mentally as a society to assume a woman as a subject of rights um, other than uh, her, her right place as a, as a good woman in society. So uh, unless she's a mother, she's a wife, uh, we have like a, a more difficulty understanding uh, the, the dimension of the transgression. And I think that's something we share like uh, in, in Latin America and probably other countries that have these uh, very um, firm uh, patriarchal structure. I would say, for example, Europe or maybe the United States have like a, um, have made like a, a, a better process at uh, being open-minded and uh, the individuality of the victim. So I, I would say that's different, but it's always affected by the the system of beliefs that every country and every culture has, because that defines the value of the victim, usually the woman, uh, on on the society and the, the dimension of the transgression. Is is the uh... The phenomenon different, and is your role different in dealing with uh, the victims of violence in, um, you know, in in war and um, um, you know, in the countryside, versus uh, dealing with violent spouses, husbands? Um, is that you? Is that a different kind of uh, involvement for you? Yes, of course. So I think that though um, both um, violences share certain elements in common, for example, as we spoke before, um, the the violation within war has uh, an intention of referring power uh, within the community. So uh, there's there's an intention of uh, transgressing the the social morality, the social values, the social beliefs. So. Um, and, and in that sense, the... Well, doesn't the, that same phenomenon exist with respect to a husband who abuses his wife? Isn't he exercising power? Yes, absolutely. But I would say this scenario is different um, because uh, let's say in the, in the private scenario, there is uh, an affirmation of, of course, a patriarchal power over women and her role. But uh, on war, we have... Uh, a more big, uh, let's say, uh, panorama in which uh, the perpetrator belongs to an armed organization that is trying to affect a whole community. So um, there, there's like a bigger, um, let's say, uh, like the way the perpetrator conceives um, the violent action is inscribed uh, with, with a more intention for cruelty, we could say. Um, of of yes of annihilating the other, pretending that the other doesn't exist. Uh, well, in the private um, sphere, though they share some elements, as you say, uh, there's not such a conscience of this. Though the the act itself is it's very transgressive and and it's accompanied by a lot of these patriarchal values and of uh, the reaffirmation of power. But I, I would say it's it's different in, in certain ways. We've, we've entitled this uh, listening um, to sexual violence uh, survivors. Uh, there's a lot of implication in that title. 
um, I guess one implication is that not everybody survives. Uh, but another implication is that listening or a psychologist uh, is, is very important. So I wonder if you could discuss with us uh, professionally how you enter into the listening experience uh, with the women who, who are survivors. How does that work? What do they talk to you about? And how do you listen? What do you say in response? Uh, um, I think that's something I'm still learning because uh, it's uh, very complex. But I would say um, the first thing one has to do when um, speaking with uh, people who have uh, lived the transgression of their human rights is uh, you have to give up your expertise because there's no one more expert on the experience they have had than the victim. And sometimes we as professionals uh, have the vice of trying to tell the victim how to feel or how to reframe their experience within certain um, meanings we have given to a generalized experience we have absolutely no idea of. So I think the first thing one has to do um, to listen is to give up your own expertise on what you think you know, but you, you really haven't lived. Um, the second thing, and I think this is a very, very difficult exercise, is to give up judgment. And this means not judging at all because that, that is impossible. We all have like our, our pre meanings from our lived experience, but you have to be conscious of which are your common judgments or your criteria when you listen to someone and bring that like to, to your conscience and, and know that that's the way you're framing the experience of the other. So that when you make, cer make certain conclusions or hypothesis about the experience of the other, you know that you yourself are, are putting yourself there. Um, yeah, that there, there's not such thing as a neutral a hearing. There, there's always something you're putting from yourself in that. So, um, and about what you ask, of, of what do they tell me and what do I say? I, I think I think that varies, but um, there, there's nothing you can say like to to make the the damage uh, this hurtful. That's something the victim has to construct herself or himself. Um, the, the, the only thing you can do is try to help him or her um, restructure the narrative of the trauma. Because trauma, because of that transgression, is always a disorganized narrative. So what we can do, uh, let's say, on, on the psychosocial um, attention to victims is, is helping them to reorganize the trauma in a way that it has some sort of sense like not not the, that the transgression has a sense, but to construct the trauma in the in the meaning of the damage, to make the damage audible, so that we we know where to do our intervention or or what to communicate to the other. Or that's that's the job. Let's say that's like the, yeah. the big picture. How do you deal with um you know the somebody who is really mm, I, I don't know enough psychology to frame the right question, but somebody who's really affected by this, somebody who's in a state of trauma, uh, who is so shaken um, that they can't function, um, somebody who is afraid that this is going to happen again, somebody who believes that her life is, is, is from a social point of view, really damaged and, and over, that she bears uh, you know, the mark of someone who has been violated. Uh, how do you, of course, you you know try to rationalize the trauma and make the the woman understand what really happened, and but but how do you deal with the damage that she has suffered and believes that she will suffer later? Right. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we have also we have come to understand that there's not um, we, we cannot solve the damage completely. There's always something that is unsolvable, untruable. And uh, part of recognizing that is also part of recognizing the, the dimension of the transgression. However, um, for big the damage has been, uh, there's always something uh, in the victim that resists the transgression. And that's where we have to focus our attention and see which parts of life uh, are still remaining and resisting and giving meaning to the existence of that person. And then uh, start from, from that to reveal all the other meanings that have been uh, fractured by the transgression. Um, so uh, we, we have to let the emotion be because there's, there's the damage and the pain. Uh, but also we have to recognize 
where's the resistance and uh, where, where is the life that it still has meaning and start from there. Well, I imagine some of the sessions do, some of the discussions you have with these women are very hard on you, uh, where you have to invest your own emo emo emotional well-being into it. Uh, it must take something out of you. You you have to be sympathetic. You have to express sympathy. Um, it it requires that you do that. But what what is it? What what what? How does it affect you, Marianne? Well, uh, part of this is recognizing my own vulnerability as a human being and as a woman who, who lives in this uh, patriarchal structure and violent structure. And um, part of that is uh, understanding that part of my humanity and of my fear and of my vulnerability is something I can put to the service of the other, to listening to the other and to come to understand in a way and uh, in, in the limits I can, because not everything is understandable. Um, how this experience has affected the other. So uh, it's not about not feeling anything, but knowing what to do with what you feel. Yeah, finding sisterhood, I suppose, uh, connecting. Do you, do, you, do you talk to them once or many times? Um, it depends on the scenarios. Like when you work with organizations or GNOs, then there, there is, uh, NGOs, I'm sorry, there is uh, a possibility of seeing the victim again and again, but for example, on the transitional justice scenario, you see the victim only uh, in the, when you're preparing them for even their testimony or to participate in the scenario. So it depends. Mm. Do, do, you ever, do you ever treat or in, engage with um, people you already know? Are any of your clientele people you know who you have met before? Does this happen on a, a repeated basis with some people? Um, are you asking me if uh, like friends or family or like uh... I'm asking two questions. One is friends or family. Also, mm -hmm. um, people that you have um, that you have seen before in connection with other previous abuses who are abused yet again. Yes. So uh, within the friends and family question, no, it's like I, I don't think it's ethical for me to to support them in in my professional way because it's. It's not objective. Um, they could benefit from other help. And uh, within the, the other transgressions, of course, I think uh, one of the complexities and the perplexities of this is that uh, a victim hasn't suffered only one crime or one transgression. So uh, they, they commonly have other stories of other crimes and other transgressions. And the thing in sexual violence is that this, this is perceived as a collateral damage to that transgression and not to a, like a transgression itself. So building that concept of this is also a transgression, not a collateral damage, is also a part of the process. Mm. So uh, this is the transitional justice, and you are associated, as, as um, your brother Nicholas is associated with Project Expedite Justice. And part of that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of that is to seek justice. Part of that is to make sure that if, if you can identify the people responsible, um, you can, you know, bring it home to them in some way. Um, is your role in dealing with this problem, does that include justice, bringing the transgressor to justice? Yes, I think uh, in my case, since I am not a lawyer, I have different, a different comprehension, comprehension from what um, justice is, and it's not a, always the recognition of the recognition of the crime. Um, and I think that that's like a very um, interesting thing about transitional justice, that uh, a part is recognizing the crime, but another part is recognizing the damage. And recognizing the damage can happen on a transitional justice scenario or, on other, or another scenario that can be a, a community space or of our private space. So bringing them to justice, I think it's bringing them to recognize not only the crime, but the damage they have made, and also like uh, this part of uh, forgiveness, you know, that we cannot force it, but they, they are supposed to uh, feel responsible and uh, ask for forgiveness in some way to return to the victim uh, what they have made. Do report cases to prosecutors? Do you seek uh, either prosecution or compensation 
uh, for the abuses that come to your attention? Well, uh, right now uh, in the place I work, which is the the, the transitional, the, the I'm sorry, the tribunal for transitional justice, um, I, I am already like on this scenario where the, the cases are reported. So uh, I, I do not report them. But uh, if you work for organizations, then it's up to the victim to say if she or he wants uh, their case reported or not, because not all victims seek justice in the in the law sense. They seek other kinds of, of justice or, or of closure. So it depends. Yeah. Um, my last uh, area of inquiry with you, Mariana, is um, um, it's it's how how does how does this work in terms of um, the psychology of it? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm interested in knowing um, where where you leave it and how it affects you, uh, how it affects Colombia. Um, this sounds like it's a serious problem. Um, what can we do on a on a social basis? You know, beyond the psychology um, to to deal with this on a on a national level and. And I'm asking not only in terms of Colombia, I'm asking how Colombia can be a model in some way for other countries, either in Latin America or elsewhere, um, because there, ha there has to be a, a larger picture here. It's not just one client, so to speak, at a time. It's the whole, may I say, enchilada. Yes. Um... What I have learned from working with these victims is that they are always very generous to present their individual cases and try to understand their cases in a context. And what they usually find, even if they are, for example, if they are women that come from rural areas that don't have like high levels of education, um, they understand that this is an, a structural problem because even if this presents, for example, in, in a war scenario, but not in a home scenario, after the war scenario and, and, and after being conscious of their perpetration, they are able to see other micro violences that have been uh, um, silenced uh, because of our naturalization or because of our lack of understanding. So um, I think the first uh, step we can do is uh, as cliche as it sounds, is sexual education in order to provide people um, the criteria to decide over their bodies, to narrate their own experience on their own terms, to respect the limits of the other. I think that's like the first answer. And that's the answer I have gotten from the, the victims. We have to educate people on thinking different, on thinking different about their, themselves, their bodies, and the, the bodies of the, of the others. That's like the, the first step that sounds like very simple, but we have not come to accomplish it in, in all human history, I think. Do you ever uh, find that your clientele in these, in these um, engagements um, want to help others? You, know, you see that in the U.S. a lot. Somebody who has had a bad experience and goes out and, and tries to um, rally the women. Uh, against uh, further abuse and belongs belong to organizations, take steps, and it's beyond just prosecution and compensation. It's a try to affect social change. Um, do the women that you see, do they join in these movements? Do they become public in their views and their efforts to change, change the society? Yes, uh, and it is very common, and that is uh, why I say they are very generous on presenting their own experience and trying to help others because uh, the understanding they have come to is so valuable and they have never seen this before uh, in any other scenario because it's always lived in private. They want to help other women overcome this. And um, the main uh, evidence of this is that most of the cases that are reported like from sexual violence are reported by uh, feminist collectives not by particular victims. Uh, and it's because uh, they, they need this uh, sorority, let's say, uh, this, uh, this uh, collectiveness uh, to, to find support on, on an experience that is very silent and judge. So uh, yes, that, that, that is something I, I see a lot and I admire a lot. Hmm. 
So Marianne, how long have you been doing this and why have you been doing it that long? And do you intend to keep on doing it for a career? Uh, yes, I started a thing uh, almost four years ago. I was uh, seeing a journalism class and uh, a war journalist, and, and we were uh, required to uh, interview a victim of, of the conflict. And um, I happened to arrive to one of these women collective, collectives that had, um, that they constructed their own, um, let's say, uh, uh, like system uh, to bring other women to report their cases and, and how to do this in, in a very empathetic way without the transgression of the of the institutions. And I was like so impacted and I admired them so much that I wanted to learn from them. And, and that, that is why I started uh, to work on this. And of course I plan to, to keep on doing this and, and learning from them and, and um, amplificating what they are doing because all of this has been constructed by the experience of victims. Uh, not not by our expertise. That that is something different. Now, as we admire you for doing it, participating in a, a social healing this way, improving the, the world around us as well as the individual lives that have been affected. Mariana uh, Sussman, uh, talking to us today about the transitional justice testimony and reparation and listening, um, listening to sexual violence survivors uh, in Bogota, Colombia. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.